Ron Busby. I'll tell you a little bit about him. As President and CEO of the U.S. Black Chambers, Inc., Ron Busby Sr. brings business management skills as well as a lifetime of community development experience to the organization. Mr. Busby is a former successful business owner himself, and he has been recognized as one of the nation's best CEOs. Ron grew his first company, USA Super Clean, from $150,000 annualized revenue to over $15 million in only 10 years. Congratulations, Ron. Early on in his career, USA Super Clean was recognized as the largest black-owned janitorial firm in the country. Mr. Busby has also started and grown two other janitorial firms, both resulting in over $4 million in annualized revenue. Currently, Ron serves on the Pfizer Small Business Council, National Newspapers Publishers Association Foundation Board of Directors, and White House African American Leadership Council. Also formerly served on the U.S. Small Business Administration's Council on Underserved Communities. Trained by some of the country's leading corporate executives, Ron developed his skills at some of the nation's largest corporations, including Exxon, Xerox, IBM, and Coca-Cola USA. While in corporate America, he was recognized as National Salesperson of the Year. Ron also has chamber experience as he was previously the president of the Greater Phoenix Black Chamber of Commerce for five years. A native of Oakland, California, and graduate with honors from both Florida A&M and Clark Atlanta University, Ron has dedicated himself to the empowerment of the black community. Ron is also a member of Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity. Ron has two sons, one which we know graduated today. Congratulations. <laughs> and currently lives in the Washington, D.C. area. Ron, we're so happy you were able to come back and join us. Our keynote speaker for this afternoon, Mr. Ron Busby. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All the folks in the back, come on up front. Come on up front. <laughs> what I'm about to say won't take long, but I promise you it'll be worth your time. Um, Again, my name is Ron Busby, and I'm the president and CEO of the U.S. Black Chambers, Inc. That's a round of applause. I want to first say thank you to Phil. Um, for those of you that don't know or who's not a member of this Chamber of Commerce, we started literally nine years ago. Uh, in 2009, uh, I moved to Washington, D.C., and when we began, we would had six chambers six chambers. We had about 40 uh, member, business members, and it was just us in a very small cubicle and a cell phone. Today we have 123 chambers, we're in 29 states, and we have a membership of over 265,000 wow. black-owned businesses. I don't want you to applaud about that because what I want you to applaud about is Phil's tirelessly mm. ability to see a future. Yes. He asked me to do three things this afternoon, and I told him I was coming up uh, for my son's graduation. He just graduated from Columbia University, so I'm sitting on cloud nine. And I feel like I just got a raise because I've been paying tuition since the second grade, so I am all right. Uh, he asked me to do a couple things this morning. He said, make sure I in inform you give you some information that you may not have. He said, secondly, I want to make sure that you motivate them. Uh, make sure that when they leave, they have a spirit of, we can. And lastly, he said, make sure you entertain them. So I will try to make sure I do all those three things. Any and every time I get the opportunity to speak in front of a microphone, I want to make sure that I acknowledge both my mother and my father uh, as the parents that they are. You see, my mother was not only an educator, uh, but she was also a Baptist minister, so I know we just had a conversation about religion. So I will say that from my mother, I gained a couple of things. I was a pretty good student, pretty smart, and I know who my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ mm. is. Right. But at the same time, I had a father, and my father was an entrepreneur, uh, and he was also a black panther. Mm. So I'm about business, mm. and I don't take no shit. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to make sure that today... As we say, we are going to make sure that we keep it plain, 
that we make sure that when you leave here, you understand that this is a community and a conversation that needs to hear the truth. You see, I grew up in Oakland, and Oakland was a very black town. Everybody in my community looked like me. Uh, my mother was a teacher, and so every year I went to a different school because she knew the best black teachers. So in the second grade, I went to John Marshall. In the third grade, I went to Frazier. In the fourth grade, I went to Carl B. Monk. Every year, I went to a different school because she said, I'm going to make sure you get the best public education we can find. Now today, if we did that same experiment, not only would my mother go to jail, but I would also be <laughs> expelled. because of, And that's not a laughing matter, because if we see what's going on in our education system today, it's no longer a free and public education that we get. It's more now a privilege to be educated. It's a privilege to have a good job. And it's a privilege to be able to be counted and recognized in this country. I left Oakland uh, after high school. I could have gone anywhere. And I, I tell this story often. I told it last night. I went to Stanford my freshman year. And I remember the first day of school, they said, look to your left, look to your right. One of y'all not going to be here. <laughs> and I picked up my bags that second day and said, well, that's probably going to be me. Let me save my parents some money. The school, a lot of frustration, and I made one of the best decisions I ever made. I transferred to Florida A&M. And I remember there, the first week, they said, look to your left, look to your right. These are the future leaders of this country. We want you to marry. We want you to go into business together. We want you to multiply because this is how we will lead our own communities. And I will never forget that. Uh, as I had the opportunity to go work in corporate America, you heard a little bit about, about my background. I had uh, stints at IBM, at Xerox, and senior manager positions. And finally at Coca-Cola, where I was a senior VP. I was 27 years old, and I remember it quite often. I used to go to work early every morning. I got there at 7, and I wouldn't leave until 7 each evening. And about three or four months into my career, my supervisor called me in and he said, Ron, I want you to pack your things and move down the hall to Joe's office. Now, Joe was a 56-year-old white guy. Joe got to work every morning at 9, and he left every evening at 5. Joe was very successful. He knew his clients. He knew his customers. He knew the industry extremely well. And I said, well, where is Joe going? And they said, well, Joe's going to be reporting to you. And that day, I decided I got to make an exit strategy. So for those of you that are in here, that have a great career, remember there's always somebody working a little bit harder, a little bit longer, and if you get too comfortable, you'll be reporting to them. Now at Coca-Cola, our largest client was McDonald's. And so I said to myself, well, if I'm going to go into business for myself, I want to make sure that I do something that is duplicatable, that I can make sure that I did anywhere around the country and I didn't want to be tied to selling a product. You see, when I was in Coca-Cola, IBM, and Xerox, all of those, I was in sales. Each morning, you had to get up and go sell a new box, a new product, a new customer. And I got tired of always having to have a quota. So I said, whatever I did, I was going to make sure that I was successful and have sustainability. You see, at McDonald's, we all know that the same french fry you get in San Francisco, you can get in Seattle, or you can get in Singapore. And it's got very little to do about how much salt you put on the fry or how long you leave it in the fryer. It is a system. And it is a system that is duplicatable, and you know what you're going to get when you order your Big Mac. And so I said to myself, well, gosh, I think I'm going to go and worked for McDonald's for a while. So I've worked every day from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. at McDonald's, and then, I'm sorry, Coca-Cola, and then I would go home each evening, change my clothes, and go to McDonald's and work from 8 p.m. to midnight. And while I was at McDonald's, I learned everything about being an entrepreneur and as well as a CEO. And I worked there for about six months, because you see, McDonald's had a program for minorities where you could buy your own franchise by earning your way in. And the reason why I say that's important is because you see there's a lot of us that have kids. I have a young man who just graduated from college today. And a lot of his peers will say, you know, I got this degree and I want to go into business for myself. And as a chamber leader, you get the question all the time, hey man, I, I think I want to go into business and 
what should I do? And most people say something that you're passionate about. Some of you don't mind putting your own money into or working 12, 14 hours a day. And I say, that's crap. Because you see, there's a lot of folk that have put up their own money, worked 12, 14, 16 hours a day, and still failed. Not because they weren't smart, not because they weren't passionate, not because they didn't work hard. They just went into the wrong business. Mm -hmm. So for our young people, the last thing we want them to do is to be 19, 20, 21, 22 years old and to go open up a business and mess up your credit. <laughs> mess up your name. You see, understand that 90% of small businesses are going to fail within the first five years. So why would you allow a young person to go into business for themselves with those types of odds? What I tell young people at Columbia when I left today, I said, you need to be at this meeting. Because you see, as African Americans, we have very, very, very few second generation firms. If you look at the black enterprise top 100 businesses, you will see businesses that have been in business 9, 10, sometimes 15 years, and then fall off. You can't find them anymore because they didn't have anyone to pass that baton to. You see, in my family, I had a father that was in janitorial business. It wasn't sexy. He didn't make a whole lot of money. He worked really, really hard. But I knew that he provided for both me as well as my sisters and my mother. My older sister is a doctor. She went to Howard University. My younger sister is an attorney. She went to Prairie View a &M. And I'm a janitor that went to Florida a &M. <laughs> <laughs> You see, I left Coca-Cola and I moved back home to the same bunk bed I had when I was in the third grade. <laughs> and a lot of people laughed just like you did because they didn't understand the vision that I had. You see, I had the same kind of vision that Phil has. I could see the future. My father's company was literally doing $150,000 in annualized revenue. When I left Coca-Cola, my annualized salary was higher than my father's business annual revenue. But I had a vision. And that vision was I was going to double my annualized revenue every year. So it wasn't that difficult to go from $150,000 to $300,000. I wore a suit and tie. So people didn't mind giving us some business. I went from 300000 to 750. It wasn't that difficult. I knew enough of the city programs. I got some city contracts. Then to go from 750 to 1.5 wasn't that difficult. I kind of now understood that there were three types of janitorial firms. There were the Hispanic firms and no disrespect. There was firms like my father's. Yes, sir, wore overalls. He was that guy. And then there was firms like myself who understood my customers, who understood their needs, understood their challenges because I had been that guy. I had made the decisions that my customers were making. So I got some businesses, and I went from 1.5 to 3 million. Then I got the 3 million if, how many of you know about a program called the 8A program, by show of hands? That's disappointing. All my millionaires are on this side of the room. <laughs> I don't know what's going on on this side of the room. But the difference between being on this side of the room and that side of the room that before I was 8A certified, I was bidding on jobs in the thousands of dollars. The day I became 8A certified, I was bidding on jobs in the millions of dollars. Am I lying? I literally went from $3 million to $7 million overnight. We were now, all of a sudden, my girlfriend was looking at rings and <laughs> homes. <laughs> my father retired. <laughs> And we were one of the largest black firms in the city of Oakland, California. And I got to a point where I was $7 million and I didn't know how I was going to double my company. And I'll never forget this. I ended up reading a book. And for those of you that like to read, I'll ask you to write this down because the name of the book is, no disrespect to any of my white friends, but why should white guys have all the fun? <laughs> and if you know anything about Reginald Lewis, Reginald Lewis was the first African-American billionaire. Let me say that again. He was the first African-American billionaire, and he was also my fraternity brother, a member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. And Reginald Lewis got there not through organic growth, but he got there through mergers and acquisitions. And so I said to myself, that's the solution. I'm going to buy the next company. Now, if you know anything about geography, I was in Oakland, California, and right down the street in the 80s was San Jose. 
It was San Jose before it was Silicon Valley. I had worked at IBM. I had worked at Xerox. I had worked in the technology field, but I literally could not even get an interview to talk to these companies about cleaning their buildings, emptying their trash, or even cleaning their restrooms. They wouldn't even allow me to come in to talk to them about a contract because they were giving all that work to their friends, their cousins, their golf partners. And I'm not mad at that. I said, though, I'm going to figure out a solution. And I ended up then looking for a firm that I thought I could acquire. And there was a firm in San Jose. They were about a $9 million firm at the time. And I learned everything about that company that I could. I interviewed all 350 of their employees. I knew every one of their customers. I knew their bankers. I knew their suppliers. I knew all of their strengths as well as their weaknesses. I went through a campaign of writing letters and sending, this was before emails, this was back in the days of fax machines. I was faxing letters. I was even putting letters in the UPS uh, packages, driving them down there myself because I couldn't afford to send them, dropping them off on their door. I was doing everything I possibly could to get their attention to no avail. I remember this distinctively. It was Thanksgiving Eve. I made a phone call to the firm and I said, my name is Ron Busby, I've been trying to reach you. And a gentleman answered the phone. He was an older white gentleman. And the guys that I had been calling on were two young white guys that had the title of president and vice president. So I assumed that they owned the firms or had the decision making opportunities. And I was calling on them for months with no response. Thanksgiving Eve, I made the phone call, the gentleman picked up the phone, and I said, I'm looking to speak with Bob. And he said, well, I'm Bob's dad. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I've been trying to reach Bob for the last few months. I wanted to come down and talk to him about a joint venture, a merger, or a possibility of an acquisition. And he said, well, if you can get here in the next 45 minutes, son, you have yourself an opportunity to speak to me. Now, for those of you that know anything about geography, again, you know it's about an hour and a half from Oakland to San Jose, and I got in my car and I made it within 45 minutes. <laughs> During the course of the next two and a half hours, I convinced Bob's father to sell me his farm. I bought an eight million, eight and a half million dollar company for literally $350,000 for one payroll. Wow. <laughs> Now, as my mama would say, you can't tell me God ain't good. <laughs> yes. But as my father would say, there's always two sides of the coin. Because you see, now I was a $15, $16 million company. I was on the road all the time. We were cleaning buildings here at the United Nations Plaza. I had Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. I was doing work at Fort Bragg Military Base. I was literally on the road two to three weeks out of the month. I was now a newlywed, and we had had our first son, and I remember this distinctively. My mother-in-law called me and she said, you need to come home. I was in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. She said, your wife is having a miscarriage. And that was my plane ride back to Oakland, like most of us sinners. I said, Lord, if you get me through this, I promise you, Lord, I'll be better this next time around. <laughs> Got home and wife made it through and we had our second son and I forgot all about that prayer and went on about mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And as life would have it, things would happen. My mother used to always have this saying, you either in the storm, getting ready to go in the storm, or just come out the storm. But always keep your umbrella with you. Mm -hmm. And so I said, Mom, why are you always hating? I'm happy. I got 750 employees. I'm married. I'm like, how can things get any better? And she said, son, nothing is forever. So I said, all right, whatever, whatever. I got this. And as life would have it, I continued to grow. I was in New York. We were doing the United Nations Plaza, and my mother-in-law called me again, and she said, you need to come home. Uh, things are getting a little crazy here with the family. Once again, I'm on the plane, on the plane ride home. I said, Lord, if you get me through this one, <laughs> I promise you I'll be a better father, I'll be a better husband. 
just get me through. This time around, my mother called me and she said, you need to be more accountable to your family. And I said, you know, you're right. We were $15 million, and at some point in time, as an entrepreneur, you understand that you have a lot of control. And we were a small company, and for most of us that are in here, we understand some of the challenges of small firms. But now I was no longer a small firm. I was a large firm. I was in San Francisco, and the largest janitorial service in the country was right in San Francisco. And they had been calling on me for years trying to acquire us. And I thought, well, gosh, that's, that's what we all want to do, right? We want to grow our firms large enough to where we can sell them and go public or make that payday. And so I said, that sounds like a great idea, and ended up selling my firm. Now, if you've never gone through that experience, we have all gone through the experience of either starting or growing a business. And starting and growing a business is like having a child. You know, you raise that child, you love that child, you nourish that child. It's the same experience when you have a business. But what you don't understand is that when you sell that business, you now become an employee of that business. And all those decisions that you put in place, all those people that you hire, you now literally become a babysitter. And so I couldn't, I couldn't sit there and watch what they were doing. You see, I had put Thanksgiving dinners on these people's tables. I had bought Christmas presents for a lot of my employees. I knew their grandchildren's name. I was there with them in graduations and births. It was my family. All of a sudden now I was just a babysitter and it hurt me. Now when you buy or sell a firm, in most cases you do a large percentage up front. In this case I got 60% of my money up front and I was supposed to work off the last 40% over the next two years two and a half to three years. I just couldn't do it. just could not see what was going on to continue to go on under my leadership. And I walked away from 40% of the revenue that I had earned. But one thing that you'll learn as an entrepreneur, that the things you learn, they can't take those away from you. Those are skills that you won't necessarily get in a college or university or working for someone else. And so I was able to take those same skills and I moved to Phoenix, Arizona. I would go to Phoenix on Monday mornings and I would go back to Oakland on Thursdays. My wife and I had three hair salons in Oakland, so she was making money, I was making money in, in Phoenix, and it was all good. I was into it about two years into it and my mother-in-law called. <laughs> <laughs> now this time, it was July the 7th, 2002, I went home to pick up my sons. They were five and six years old. Brought them back to Phoenix for the weekend. Just the weekend. My wife was going to go to Atlanta to the hair show. She was going to come back to Phoenix for the Tuesday, and we were going to go back to Oakland on Wednesday, July the 7th, 2002. July the 9th, I got a phone call from my mother-in-law. My wife just died. I got a five-year-old and a six-year-old son. I'm in a brand new city, Phoenix, Arizona. 3% black folk are 3% in Arizona. I have no idea who is who in Phoenix, Arizona. The one thing, actually the two things that got me through was my church home, Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church, and the Greater Phoenix Black Chamber of Commerce. And I said, if you can get me through these next couple years with my sons, I won't forget you, and I promise you, you won't forget me. You see, when I came in, I was like a lot of y'all in the back room over there. I was a small guy, wasn't doing much, and wanted to be a part of something bigger than me. I had been the president of 100 Black Men in Oakland. I had been Paul Mark, or president of my chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi. So I knew enough about leadership and egos and how to work folk together and had been at the church. So I knew enough about, you know, where people sit and who gives what and how that works. And I didn't want to just be the small business owner. So I couldn't afford the corporate membership because the corporate membership was $10,000. I didn't have that. So what I did, I said, well, how much is it to clean your building? Greater Phoenix Black Chamber of Commerce. And they said, we pay about $1,000 a month. I said, done. I'll do that for you for free. That'll be my contribution. That'll be my corporate membership. And we'll call it a day. And they said, great. Now, mind you this, Phil. How often you get phone calls every day saying, hey, I'm looking for somebody that does X, Y, and Z. Every day I showed up at the 
Greater Phoenix Black Chamber of Commerce vacuum and sweeping in my suit and tie. Because any opportunity that came to the chamber, I wanted them to think of me first. Now, after I started to grow my firm, I said, I'm going to make sure I give back. If you remember this, in 2008, in Phoenix, Arizona, we had a governor there. She was a Democrat. Her name was Governor Janet Napolitano. She was the first governor to come out to endorse then Senator Barack Obama. If you also remember Arizona, we had a senator there that was running for president in 2008 named John McCain. John McCain's wife had the Budweiser distributorship in Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix, Arizona, we had a brand new football state. And if you remember anything about Arizona, we were the last state to endorse and say and acknowledge Martin Luther King's birthday. That was because the Black Chamber said we're not going to allow the Super Bowl to come to Phoenix until you acknowledge Dr. King's birthday. Don't tell me what people can't do if there was only 3% of them. Let me tell you how it all worked out. The Cardinals moved to, to a new stadium. We had John McCain's wife was the big Budweiser distributor there. She said, Ron, I really like you. I've seen what you've done in this community. We're going to give you the janitorial contract to clean the Cardinal Stadium. Wow. <laughs> there were 72,000 seats in that stadium. Mm. I remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> I have a story, but I'll wait until I'm a later. <laughs> But you, what you remember in 2008, though, is that we had a senator then named Barack Obama who many of us didn't know. I didn't know him, but I loved to play golf. And he'd like to play a little golf as well. And he used to do a lot of his planning meetings right outside of Phoenix, Arizona, in Flagstaff. Once a quarter, he would come and he'd have his meetings, and then we would go play golf that afternoon. And I remember asking him, I said, so man, I hear you want to run for some kind of office. What is it that you like to do? And he said, I think I want to run for president. <laughs> and I said, president of what? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, president of the United States. And I said, man, get out of here. <laughs> Your middle name is Hussein. He just <laughs> has I said, but if you do run, we got your back. Yes. Fast forward, we know what happened in 2009. Mm -hmm. We elected the first African-American president. And in 2009, he came to a meeting very similar to this, where he had probably 300 African-American organizations, from the NAACP to the 100 black men, to all the fraternities and sororities, everything black you could think of. And he said, I want to introduce you to the new black chamber, the new voice of black business. That was 2009. We had six chambers then, and today we have 129. And I want to thank Phil for having me. <laughs> In 2009, when I first moved to Phoenix, it was, I'm used to 90 degree weather, you know, hot all the year around. I came to DC, it was nine feet of snow, it was <laughs> negative 30 degrees, and it felt like I was supposed to be there. In Phoenix, I remember I was single. Didn't really have a whole lot of outlook for what the future lied. I felt like Satchel Paige. You guys remember Satchel Paige, the old baseball player? And Satchel Paige's one line was, put me in, coach. I think I got one more in me. And that's how I felt. I was like, I got one more in me. If you just give me the opportunity, I think I can pitch another inning, hit a few more base hits. I don't know about grand slams, but I promise you, I'll keep swinging. And when I moved to Washington, D.C., it was a spirit of change and hope and, yes, we can. And I distinctly remember thinking as I drove around Washington, D.C., if you look at the back of our license plate, it literally reads, taxation without representation. And I thought to myself, how dare they talk about black folk like that? Because yeah. <laughs> that's who we have been. We have been paying into a system that has not represented our interests at all. Now, we've just had a conversation about churches. Churches have always been 
a great place to go and be a leader. We've got great organizations like the Urban League and the NAACP, but their foundation was not on an economic conversation. The Chambers of Commerce are here to advocate on behalf of black businesses. Nothing else. We're not, we're unapologetic about what we do, and we do it on your behalf. Our second one, literally, is access to capital. And if you ask any small business in America what their number one concern is, they will say access to capital. But if you ask a black-owned business what their top one, top two, and top three concern, they will say access to capital. You could have a $150,000 job, you could own your own home, and have a pretty decent credit score. Your interest rate is going to be 20%. Actually, the average African-American on credit is paying 19.87%. My white peer could have the same income, live in my same community, and work with me and make less money than me, and he will pay 9.9% .9 interest. That's discrimination that we don't even recognize. We're just happy to get credit. We don't care what it costs. We just say, I need a little bit of money to start my business. Now, no disrespect to any banking partners because we partner with them all, from Wells Fargo to B of A to all the small ones in the middle. But what the U.S. Black Chamber said is, I'm about black folk. So we partnered with Liberty Bank, which is the largest black-owned bank in the country. We went to Liberty and said, look, man, we are putting a lot of money into your bank. You see, it was the U.S. Black Chamber that started the Bank Black, Buy Black initiative. You see, two years ago, I was speaking to a crowd like this, and I said this to this crowd. I just bought a home. And when I bought my home, I used a black realtor. Not only did I use a black realtor, but I used a black mortgage company. And I used a black banker. And I used a black moving company. And I used a black ins pest control inspector. And a black home inspector. And a black installation inspector. Everyone that touched the transaction looked like me. And they didn't even know each other. The second thing I did was I paid them what they ask. Yeah. Let me say that again. Because in our community, we are good for asking for the homie hookup. <laughs> Can I get a little love? <laughs> Can you hook a brother up? <laughs> but if you really look at our challenges within our community, the number one challenge we have is unemployment. There are 2 million African-American unemployed people right now today. That's the bad news. The good news is there's 2.6 million African-American-owned businesses. I'm not an economist, but simple math says that if each one of those businesses hires one of those folk that's unemployed, I don't care about who's in the White House. I don't care about what the budget is. You hear a lot of folk talk about black folk got a trillion dollars spending power. First off, that's a lie. Black folk got two trillion dollars <laughs> spending power. Because you see, the trillion dollars that they talk about, that's the consumer spending. The other trillion dollars that we talk about is the business spend. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. That's two trillion dollars. Now, you'll hear me say this a lot. The Asian dollar stays in their community, mm -hmm. 21 days. Hispanic dollar stays in their community 19 days. The African American dollar, it used to be six hours. Now it's four and a half. 4.5 hour, our dollar leaves wow. our community. We get the check, and I'm running to the first white firm I can find and say, take my money. We don't have to worry about what's going on outside of our community because we're boycotting our own businesses. So what the U.S. Black Chamber said was, we can control some of that. But when I go and talk to my corporate friends, as well as my black friends, they say, well, I would love to do more business with black folk, but I can't find them. So we said, well, I got a solution. <laughs> Everybody take out their phone. Everybody got a smartphone in the room. Yep, yep. I need you to download this free mobile app. GPS driven. There's 47,000 black-owned businesses in there right now today. 
It's called the US BC mobile app. Free of charge, free to use, and if you're a business owner, you can put your information in there for $40 a year. Now, I get up every morning, every morning in Maryland, and I buy a bagel and a cup of coffee. Guess what? In the state of Maryland, in the state of Virginia, in the District of Columbia, there's not one owned, one, not one black owned bagel store. So, Phil, how often do you get the conversation about, man, I want to go into business, what do you think I should do? I say, open up a bagel store. <laughs> black folk buy bagels? But we so busy doing the same things that we are historically done that we miss it out on the opportunity. And it takes the same amount of effort to make a bagel as it does to make ribs or fried chicken. We eat more food than just old food. We have to think outside of the box and the app will allow you to find out what we don't have. Because in Phoenix, Arizona, if you put black owned on the outside of the building, we will come. It was funny because you see, and Phil can tell you this, when I do my conferences, 70% of all of the money that we spend goes to black folk. I do my conference at a black owned hotel. I'm so happy that I had my limo driver today because we use black limo service, black transportation. Everything that we touch is with other black folk. But you'd be ironic, it's, it's so ironic that when I went to the National Association of Black Hotel Owners and Operators, and I said, look, man, I want to do a partnership with you because I want all of my chambers around the country to make sure that they're doing their events at black hotels. And they said, whoa, 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 whoa. Can't give you that list, man, because I said, well, why not? Well, I mean, I don't want nobody to know we black. Oh. I said, well, man, the name of your organization, the National Association of Black Hotel Owners and Operators. Yeah, but I don't want to lose my white clients. You see, there's a myth that goes on that white folk ice is colder than ours. If you haven't heard that, there's a myth that goes that white folk ice is colder than ours. My great grandfather used to deliver ice on a truck back in the day before there was refrigeration trucks. And he used to tell me, he said, you know, we have these blocks of ice in the back. I'll deliver them to my white customers first thing on Saturday mornings. And their ice stays in their box for seven days and it keeps their fruits fresh and their meats fresh and their milk fresh. It lasts for seven days. He said, by the time I get to my black clients, the ice had melted down a little bit, got a little chipped away a little bit. So their ice only lasts five and a half days. I said, well, Daddy Ray, that was my grandfather's name. I said, well, Daddy Ray, because of a black man, we created the ice maker. So ain't nobody's ice colder than ours. I can get crushed ice, cubed ice, flavored ice, <laughs> colored ice if I want to, but there is no one else's ice that's colder than our ice. And when we start seeing our businesses that way, we will start to see our businesses that way. We will be unapologetic about who we are and the products and services that we own and operate. Our third pillar, as we call them, our first one is advocacy. Our second one is access to capital. Our third one is contracting. And we really look at contracting from three different vantage points. You hear us talk about what black folk are doing. We also talk about what the government spends. And lastly, we talk about what corporate America is spending. Now, a lot of folk will say, well, no disrespect to anybody, but STEM is the way to go. And I know, Phil, you into STEM, and a lot of us are. But understand this. I used to code. I worked at IBM. I coded BASIC and FORTRAN. If I went to Google today and said I want a job in coding, they'd laugh me up out of there. We don't need more sharecroppers. Let me say it again. We don't need more sharecroppers. We need more entrepreneurs. We need to yes. control our own communities with the products and services that we buy. And when we can control that, we can control our dollar as well as our destiny. Our next one is entrepreneurial training. And you heard me say a lot about 
me going to an HBCU, two of them, undergrad at Florida A&M and graduate school at Clark Atlanta University. That's the good news. The bad news is there will be more black folk that graduate from one university this year than all the HBCUs combined. And that university is the University of Phoenix. Because you see, a lot of black folk go to school four years, five years, six years, and never graduate because of life. We gotta go to work, we gotta take care of our families, we gotta life. University of Phoenix, we went to him and said, we understand you guys are definitely marketing to black folk. We want to have a hand in that. And so now, the University of Phoenix has partnered with the U.S. Black Chamber to create a curriculum specifically for African-American business owners. 18 weeks, and when you finish, you get credit, real college credit, plus you will now have a real business plan. And I say real because there are a lot of organizations, a lot of associations, a lot of agencies that were out there will, that will give you a hypothetical best case, case study business plan that you will take and file in your drawer and never use again. I want to make sure that when you finish this 18-week program that two things happen. You see, when we go to the bank, the bank will say, I'm going to give you a loan, but it's going to be a high interest rate, and I'm going to typically give you about 40 or 50% of what you say you need. Just enough for you to fail. Just enough for you to fail so that someone else can come behind you, typically that don't look like you, to be able to take over the opportunity that you've just established. And so we say with the University of Phoenix, along with our banking partners, that when this business finishes this 18 week, we're going to determine what they really need, how long they need it, and what interest rate they need it at, and we will fulfill that need. So you can come to us, and when you finish, you will have a sustainable business. And our last pillar is chamber development. And I speak a little bit about that uh, because as a former chamber president of a local community, uh, as Phil knows, you got to wear a lot of hats. As a chamber president, you part preacher, <laughs> part teacher, part mentor, part coach, part politician, part editor. And many times, we ain't never made a payroll. We've never had to go and talk to an elected official. We've never had to write an op-ed. We've never had to go down and advocate for someone else. And so we bring these chamber presidents to Washington, D.C. once a year for a four-day training. And Phil has had the opportunity to come visit with us last year. And I opened the door for you to come to visit us as well. June the 14th to the 17th in Washington, D.C. at the Black-Owned Marriott Marquis, uh, which is the nicest hotel in Washington. And on the last day, we will be spending it at the Black, or the African-American History Museum in Washington, D.C. as well. Um, I'm going to finish with this. Being in Washington, D.C., you've heard over the last year a lot about making America great again. I was on my way up here and I was at the train station and I saw all these young white kids with t-shirts that said, make America great again. And it kind of gave me a economy. I didn't know how to quite feel because you see, we want America to be great again as well. But we say in order for America to be great, you've got to have a great black America. Right? You can't have one without the other. And in order for there to be a great black America, you need great black businesses. And in order for there to be great black businesses, we need great black chambers. And so I ask you, no, I implore you to do a couple of things for me this afternoon. If you're not a member, if you're not a member of the Long Island African American Chamber of Commerce, I challenge you to join the J today. Secondly, I challenge you to look to the person to your left and to the right and say, we're going to do some business together this year. Yes. Make that commitment right now today. Go do some business because that's where it starts. It starts with a commitment. You can find out more information about us. I have some flyers about our credit card. The credit card again is at nine point nine six percent. You can get it with a credit score as low as five hundred and seventy. 
Let me say it again. 9.96% interest. Let me say it again. 9.97% interest. No, no, no. 9.96% interest. I just dropped it for you. <laughs> With a credit score as low as 570. With a black owned bank. Do good while doing good. What we did was, and I'm going to finish, Phil. We, 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 we started the black bank movement, and a lot of folk got so excited about it that we were talking to our chamber in Columbus, Ohio, and they were literally driving to Chicago, Illinois, to make a deposit because they felt that committed to the, to the movement. But understand this. Banks don't make no money when you put a deposit in it. Banks lose money until you have a balance of $1,400. Most black folk don't have $1,400 sitting in a checking account. We done spent that five times. <laughs> Allied Bank is a bank that many of us have heard about. And Allied Bank don't have no branches. You can't go to a brick and mortar Ally Bank institution. Ally Bank is all online. You see, there's only one black bank west of the Mississippi, and that's United One out of LA. Now, I hate to take a little bit of credit, but if many of you watched the movie uh, about the uh, New Edition movie, mm -hmm. and in the New Edition movie, there was a gentleman in there named Gerald Busby. Gerald Busby was the CEO of Motown. That's how he was most known. That was my uncle. But after Gerald left Motown, he went and started the bank in L.A. He understood that in order for our community to have sustainability, we have to have access to capital. The number one issue that we can do, because we started this after the Ferguson Institution, a lot of black folk don't want to go out and pick it and throw rocks and boycott. We want to do something that has momentum but has sustainability. You can now switch those dollars from any of your existing bank accounts over to this new black-owned bank that's been around now for 40 years and get a lower interest rate, still continue. On June 14th, we will take it one step further. The SBA has guaranteed a 7A loan program with us that will allow you to now get up to $350,000, and the SBA will guarantee up to 75% of that loan. The U.S. Black Chamber is really founded in order to make you successful. That is our whole mission. Our whole mission is to make you successful. And so I'm excited about being here, Phil, uh, your chair, uh, as well as your hopefully new elected officials will all say the same thing. I had the opportunity to come up here for the debates uh, last year and saw a lot of you, uh, but this is our chance. Yes. We vote every single day with our dollars. Mm -hmm. right. When we make the decision to spend money, that's who we're giving our control to. And so I ask you to do a couple things again. Write a check to the Long Island African American Chamber and to the person that's right and left of you Find a way to do some business with them. And let's do a last thing. When we go into a black business and their service isn't maybe as up to par of what you want it to be, the last thing I want you to do is to leave there disappointed. What I want you to do is to challenge the business owner and say, look, I didn't like this particular experience. I didn't like the product or I didn't like the service, but I'm telling you what, I'll come back in a week or two weeks or a month and if you corrected this issue, then I'll bring you another customer. Yeah. Wow. That's how we're Thank you very much.